CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. A little work, a little play... A sunbeam in a winter's day. These are all the things I crave. Between the cradle and the grave. Between the cradle and the grave is but a moment. A moment in time. The tiniest tick of eternity. But sometimes there is a moment that may last forever. What do you want, Emily? You know what I want. I want this for Tommy. But what can I do for Tommy? You can do everything. I'm doing everything for Tommy. I can't do any more. You can and you will. Do you want to destroy me? If doing the right thing destroys you, then you're better off dead. Our mystery drama, Guilty Secret, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Greyhound Package Express. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There is an incurable disease that attacks so many people in public life. Although its victims are found all over the country, by far the greatest number of those afflicted are concentrated in Washington, D.C. We're not sure if the cause is a bacterium, bacillus, or virus. In any case, the name for it is irreverently given as Bugus Presidentialis. Ah, yes. Once bitten by Bugus Presidentialis, a man will know neither rest nor peace until he is elected president of the United States, which accounts for all those fidgety people in politics. Well, we're about to observe Bugus Presidentialis in action. Hello, Senator. Jim! Well, sit down. I didn't know you were in town. Flew in this morning. Well, well, what brings you here? What brings me to the office of the junior senator of one of the least popular states of the Union? <laughs> you ask the question, you answer it. Well, do you want to run for president? Do I what? I think you heard me. I assume you mean president of the United States. Naturally. Well, to tell you the truth, Jim, I never thought about it. That's not the truth. Everybody thinks about it. No, I mean seriously. So do I. Melvin Lewis Blaisdell. A fighting district attorney, fine reform governor, now a quiet, competent senator, and only 42 years of age. Now, look, Jim, I promised the people of my state that I'd actively pursue their interests in the Senate. Of course. But you have a higher duty to the people of your country. Uh Uh-oh. The party's in trouble, is it? No, no. We suddenly realize we have a chance to win. The other side hasn't really solved the basic problems, the economy, the environment, so forth. Well, do we have a program that'll solve them, Jim? No. But it's our turn to holler, turn those rascals out. And turn these rascals in. (laughs) (laughs) Why me, Jim? George Hayes and Frank Rogers are killing each other off. Well, may the best man win. But the best man won't win. And he'll drag the other one down with him. Well, surely for the sake of party unity. What unity? Hayes and Rogers are having a blood feud. We need you. Why me? That's the second time you asked that question. Well, you might answer it. Because it's the magical meeting of the man and the moment. What did you say? Huh. What did I say? And it came out of nowhere. The magical meeting of the man and the moment. That's our slogan. But what does it mean, Jim? Oh, does it matter, Mel? You're a fresh face, a youthful face. You come from a one-party state, so you never had to slug it out with the opposition. You never made any real enemies. The liberals think you're really a liberal. The conservatives think you're really a conservative. What are you, Mel? I dislike labels, Jim. There you are. Everybody's friend. But it's too late. 
Why is it too late? Half the primaries are already over. And they proved absolutely nothing. We've still got five of the big ones ready and waiting. But why me, Jim? You know, I think that'll look good on your tombstone. Look, sure, I want it. I've been bitten by the bug, you know, how long ago when I first got into politics. And you know when that was? In third grade when I ran for milk monitor. Well, I started in kindergarten. Well, you're going to make it, Mel. Well, I want to prepare for it. I want to build up a record in the Senate first. You're ready now. It's the magical meeting of the so on and so forth, whatever it was I said before. We're tired. We, the people, are tired of the same machine-made candidates. And I tell you, Mel, there's a groundswell out there for a true man of the people. There is? Letters to the newspapers inquiring about this quiet but dedicated Senator Blaisdell. I haven't read any. You will. Jim, how do you know that I'll be able... Mel, we've had a few private polls taken. And your name headed the list. So, Mr. Abu Ben Adam, that's how it is. I wonder if I'm really qualified. No humility is wasted on me. Do you really think I can get the nomination? I know you can. And you're the one who can win. Mr. Independent, the unbossed candidate. It's the people who nominated you, Mel, all over the country, the plain, ordinary, everyday people. They formed the clubs. They went out and rang the doorbells. Which reminds me, Jim. Money. Don't worry about money. <laughs> Funny. The time comes when you least expect it. Do you want to talk it over with Laura? Laura? Hmm. That's the name of Senator Thompson's wife. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yours is... Uh, uh, well, wait, wait. Don't, don't tell me. Uh, Gloria. Yes. And she's an asset. Pretty enough to turn on the men and uh, not so beautiful that she turns off the ladies. <laughs> and those four good-looking kids of yours. Oh, three, Jim. Well, they're good-looking. I have to see about getting the groundswell started. Those are the hardest to arrange the spontaneous ones. We'll do it, Mel Blaisdell. His only debt is to the folks who voted for him. Also to those who didn't. Was there ever a man more generous in victory? And we'll talk more later in the day. I got a million wheels to set in motion. Jim, I can't believe it. Believe it. I wonder if I'll be able to sleep tonight. Uh, that's one of the things you'll have to give up. I'll check with you later. So long, Mel. Congratulations. Thanks, Jim. Don't thank me. Thank the people. Oh, uh... Yes, Jim. Uh, there's just one thing. What's that? It's something we have to talk about just one time, and then we can forget it. Yes? Mel, I want you to tell me there won't be any surprises. Surprises? And let's say a week before Election Day, the other side won't be able to come out with a, uh, a surprise. A surprise? A surprise we couldn't recover from, like, uh... They have found absolute proof that you were actually Jack the Ripper. <laughs> what? Or you took a million dollars or even 15 cents from a utility company or an oil company. You know the kinds of things I'm talking about. Yes, of course. So, are there have to be any surprises? Now, don't answer quickly. Will there be? Can there be any surprises? No. No, Jim. There won't be any surprises. Roanoke Street Library, Miss Hawkins. Hello? Emily? Yes? Emily, it's... I know. Emily, I must talk to you. I... Emily, I must. I don't see any reason. Please, I'll explain. What is there to explain? Please. No. The break is clean. It's final. Please, Emily, you must talk to there me. There is no point. Emily, I must talk to you for only five minutes. Just five minutes. Now, you know that place along Route I-95? <laughs>
Emily? Yes? We can sit in your car. Will you follow it? Why would anyone follow me? Look, I'm sorry I'm late. I, I had to make sure that I wasn't being followed. Well, Melvin? Melvin. You're the only person who ever called me Melvin. Is that why we're here? To reminisce? How's the boy? Fine. I mean, how's he doing? Very well. He's going to nursery school, isn't he? Yes. Well, that's good. That's, that's very good. What is the point of all this? Why make it so hard on yourself and on me? After all, I am his father. But we agreed it would be best all around if that fact was forgotten. I can't be that cold-blooded about it. You're not. You're supporting him. And very generously, too. Emily. Who knows about the child? You do. I do. Who else? Is that what you wanted to ask me? Who else knows that I'm his father? Only you and I know that. Are you sure? How many times have I told you? I have to be sure. All right, I'll tell you again. It's exactly the same. When I found out I was... I went to New York, you know that. I had the baby at a private hospital. When I came back here, I told everyone who was my sister's son that she had died in childbirth. Still the same story. It's just that I have to be certain that no one else... No one doubted me when I told it the first time, and no one's ever made an issue of it since. (laughs) After all, who cares about a... a librarian named Emily Hawkins? Who knew about you and me? Nobody. Are you positive? Melvin, I really resent this entire conversation. Emily, people talk... There are those girls who like to say, you know who I've been dating? Well, I am not one of those girls. Then nobody knows about us? Nobody ever knew, and nobody knows now. Emily, tomorrow morning, you're going to read something in the paper. A statement by me. Yes? I'm going to announce that I've been prevailed upon to seek the nomination for president. Congratulations. I'll vote for you. Emily, if anyone even has the slightest idea... Melvin, I told you, nobody knows. Nobody will ever know. Because you could destroy me. Why would I want to do that? I don't know what I'm saying. Poor Melvin. Look. It isn't as if you seduced me, you know? I was just as willing as you were. More, if you want the truth. And then later, you didn't abandon me. You were even willing to divorce your wife. I walked out on you. I have no hold on you. No claim on you. Millions of people may not take that view of it. But millions of people aren't ever going to know about it. Oh, Melvin... It wasn't love that brought us together. It was loneliness. This is a bad town for a single girl. And for a married man without his wife. And so we made our mistake. You're paying for it, Emily. You have the child. You're paying even more. You don't have the baby. Same, Emily. Say, Melvin. Oh, I'm sorry it had to work out this way. Melvin, we really must never see each other again. Yes. But it's it's okay to deliver the money the same way, though. The baby and I don't need that much. Goodbye, Melvin. Emily. Emily, I'm so ashamed of myself. For what? For the way I panicked. You know what I thought? Tell me. I had a crazy idea that you would try to blackmail me. Melvin. It's it's the spot that I've been placed in. You can't imagine the crazy things it does to you. And this is only the beginning. No. No, I'm all right now. You and I 
Or a closed book, Melvin. Yes. I'd like to kiss you goodbye for old times' sake. Better not, Melvin. You might open the book. And how many pages are there in that book? Certainly a great many interesting ones have already been turned. And what lies ahead? Surprises? We thought there aren't supposed to be any. Not much. Well, it's only a short while till Act Two. Power, said Lord Acton, tends to corrupt. No doubt. Because power may be looked upon as a disease. A disease so virulent that not only does its actual possession corrupt, but even its prospect will corrode. The mere idea of power changes all the senses in the human body. Most important, it sharpens the eye. Oh, not the eyes in the head, but the eyes in the ego. We're listening to a political speech. We cannot look back to the old methods, but we can and must make sure of the old virtues. Honesty, loyalty, integrity. These are the basic qualities of the American people. And these must be the basic qualities of America's leaders. Thank you. Well, how did I sound, Gloria? You were sensational, Mel. I told him that. And so were you, Gloria. Me? I didn't do anything. Oh, yes, you did. You did. Well, I just sat there. That is an art and a science. To just sit on a platform? Mm, to sit there and look adoringly at your husband. <laughs> well, I do adore him. And what do we see on your face? Well, I don't know. Exactly what he's talking about. Honesty, integrity, loyalty. You're in, Melvin. You're in. Jim, was I really effective? Come on, Mel. What did I tell you about humility? Hello? Yes, I'm Mrs. Blaster. Who? Oh, well, uh, thank you. My husband's a great fan of yours, too. Oh, of course, I'll let you speak to the senator. Who is it, dear? It's that fabulous country music star, Jim Bob Marlowe. Good Lord, I can't stand that whining caterwauling. Oh, now. Why do I want to talk to him? I arranged for him to call you. Why? Because he sells millions of records and his name has the highest recognition factor in the country. Well, look no further. That's what's wrong with America. Go ahead, Mel. His time is very valuable. The trouble with these so-called singers is that they never blow their noses. Hello? Yes, Mr. Marlowe. Well, thank you. I'm a great fan of yours, too. Yes. Well, it is the true, the, the essential American music. You do? Well, I'd be honored, Mr. Marlowe. Please, you'll have to call me Mel. <laughs> well, certainly. Well, look, when you're in the neighborhood, you must drop in on us. Well, we're just folks, too. <laughs> I will, indeed. Yes, and thank you. Goodbye. Oh, I think I'm going to be sick. What did he want? Well, you can't guess what old Jim Bob wanted. I can. No, you don't count. You probably put him up to it. I did. You don't know what a coup this is. He wants to be MC at the inaugural ball, and that's cheap enough for what he's going to do. What is he going to do? He's going to write the theme song of the campaign, The Magical Meeting of the Man and the Moment. But I think that's marvelous. Can you imagine him whining that all over the country? Oh, darling, you're just going to have to pretend you love it. Jim, I want to tell you about Mel. He means what he says. Mel's a very decent guy. Honey, I mean, you don't have to sell me to Jim. And the people sense it. That is why he'll be nominated and elected. You know, there are men in public life who brag about their devotion to their wives and their children. <laughs> we know it's phony, mm, but not Mel. His wife, his three boys, are his world. We know that, too. You see, Mel looks at fatherhood as a privilege. He just can't understand how a man can neglect his children, not to mention abandon them. Mel's just never too busy for his kids. There's always time for a ball game, a hike, or just to sit around. You know, he, he is the most unusual father. You know, I'm getting a headache. I think my halo is on too tight. I want Jim to know all about you. When Mel first came to Washington, he wasn't going to interrupt the boys' schooling. He came here alone, 
Then he lived here alone for a full year. It was very difficult for Mel to be separated from us. You, you know, he almost changed his mind about the Senate. But the boys and I said, you've got to do it. Because one day, we'll all live in the White House. And now it's going to happen. Oh, Mel. Mel, I'm so proud. So proud. My goodness, you must be Senator Blaisdell. Well, you are, aren't you? Yes. I happen to notice you come here quite often. I just can't get over it. I mean an important senator sitting on a park bench. You, uh, you're in charge of those children, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I'm their nursery school teacher. My name is Jim Miller. They're lovely children. Mm, yes. Three-year-olds. Oh, my, it's such a special age. Tommy, you mustn't hit Sarah Jane with your shovel. She only wants to share. <laughs> oh, he's so cute. But he's going to be a problem. Oh? He realizes he has no daddy like the other kids. Oh, that's too bad. Tommy Hawkins. Yes, he's an orphan. He was adopted by his aunt. A lovely woman. She's a librarian. Oh, Senator, I know you're going to win. He has such blonde hair and such blue eyes. And you know why? And that smile... Because you just sit here on a bench like everyone else. That smile can break your heart. And just talk about ordinary, everyday things. What? Senator, is, is something wrong? Hmm? Oh, I, uh... No, I, I just have something in my eye. Oh, but we sit here. Oh, we have such terrible smog. Yes, that's right. Let it here. It will wash itself out. Oh, would you please uh, take me... Yeah, I know your address, Senator. Hey, Senator. You know something? You're going to go all the way. Well, thank you. I'd mortgage the house to bet on it. I've been pushing a hack for 45 years in this town. I've seen them come and go. But I spotted you right off the bat. You did? When you first come here, it must have been uh, nearly four years ago. I, I, I says to myself, this fellow's on his way. <laughs> I was right. Well, I hope you're right. Yeah, I remember I uh, I picked you up a couple of three times. You'd leave this in this office building. And where would you go? To some real hot night spot like a lot of them other congressmen who were on the town? No, sir. <laughs> yeah, I remember where I'd take you. You do? Sure. To the library. The library? Yeah. The Roanoke Street Library. <laughs> the library. That's where you used to go for a good time. <laughs> All them other guys are Tom catting around. We need a man like you, Senator, who believes in the home and the family and marriage. Yeah, marriage is taking a bad beating these days, ain't it? <laughs> Yeah? Is, is something wrong? Why? Why do you ask? Well, you keep tossing and turning. Can't you sleep? Darling, you're shivering. Gloria. What is it? Gloria, I realize right now, this very minute, I realize that I'm going to get the nomination. Well, but that was obvious right after the California primary. All I'm saying is that I realize it. For the first time, it's going to happen to me. I'm going to leave that convention as the nominee of the party. Of course, Mel, of course. I'm frightened. What's there to be frightened of? Of course, I know. It's the awesome responsibility. But we both know you can do the job. I'm frightened, Gloria. Of what? Tell me, Mel, please tell me. Oh, I can't. Mel, I know that once you become president... There'll be certain secrets you can share with no one, not even me. And certain times when you'll have to be all alone. But surely it hasn't started yet, has it? Now, what, what are you doing? I'm getting dressed. Why? I have to go out. At this hour? Where? Please, don't ask me, Gloria. But certainly you can tell me where no you're going. No one must know about this. Uh, I'll be back very soon. Please tell me. Gloria, please, don't ask me. Please. <laughs> Uh, 
Finley. Well, then, you know we can't meet each other anymore. I know. Even this, now, tonight. It could be a disaster for you. Emily, what am I going to do? About what? About us. What is there to do? Now, you never told anyone you had ever gone out with me. Now, then, I keep telling you over and You're over. You're positive there's no way that anyone could ever know. Please get hold of yourself. Yes, yes, I've got to do that. I've got to. Emily, do you realize that I've got that nomination sewed up? Everybody knows that. And the polls say that I can win the election easily. And you're going to. But I have a nightmare, Emily, a recurring nightmare. You're shivering. Want me to turn on the heater? I have the nomination. And I'm running for election, and I'm ahead just as the polls say I am. And then, just a week before election day, the headlines break. About you and me and Tommy. Melvin. That's how they do it. They'd save it for the final week of the campaign. But I keep telling you there's absolutely And in this no... nightmare, the, the newspaper headlines, the radio, the TV commentators, everybody takes shots at me. I'm the greatest hypocrite who ever ran for the office. Nobody knows. Emily, I can't tell you the lengths to which my opponents will go to investigate, the depths to which they'll sink. Have they already found out? Do they know right now? Are they saving it for the last split second? <laughs> As you know, all's fair in love and war. And, of course, politics, which is a combination of both. As the philosophers will tell you, anxiety is the natural state of man. And so Senator Blaisdell has more than his share. And if you're anxious for the third act, it shall arrive in just a few moments. a mushroom or a toadstool? Is the bite of the snake harmless or fatal? Are there sharks in that beautiful lagoon? In the final analysis, the definitive answer can only be supplied by the one who tastes, the one who is bitten, or the one who swims. This may be finding out the hard way, but what other way is there to truly acquire wisdom? Emily, I don't know what to do. What is there that you can do? Step aside. How could you do that? I can simply say I changed my mind about seeking the office. Your career would be over. If the other side knows about us, my career's over anyway. But you can't be sure that they know. I can't be sure of anything. All I have is doubt and fear. I don't know what to think. Emily, there's no way for anyone to know, is there? You keep asking and asking. I'm sure. You don't sound because sure. Because you keep hammering at me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Emily. I just keep reviewing every moment. I don't see what... I walked into the library that evening. We never saw each other before. It all started when I asked you about a book. No one was close enough to overhear. I don't know what got into me. What even made me ask? I just couldn't help myself. And I couldn't either. We never went anywhere, not to your place or to mine, not even to a motel, so there's no desk clerk who might remember. We just meet here. <laughs> like high school kids. Never even went to a restaurant. We'd bring dinner here. Mm, Chinese food. Pizza. And we'd spend the evening off the side of the road, hidden by the trees. Yeah. In friendly darkness. So? We were never seen anywhere together. I know, I know. Now then, what is it? You're safe. Oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's just the pressure. But you're asking for a job that places more pressure on a man than any other position in the world. I know that. Then maybe... Yes? Now then, you have the intelligence and the understanding to withstand pressure. I know. But I have a guilty secret. Why is it guilty? And for that matter, why must it be kept secret? What are you saying? Do you mean that you... No, no. Never. It's for you to acknowledge this trial. I can't do that. Maybe that's what's bothering you. I'd lose the election. Then you have to decide. Either withdraw or just Put it out of your mind. Yes, I know. And this is the last time we will ever 
see each other. And as we approach the convention, the conviction is growing that Senator Melvin Lewis Blaisdell is the choice. Perhaps this is truly the magical meeting of the man and the moment. Daily, he seems to be gaining in stature. He manifests a coolness, a calmness, a confidence. As you can see, Mel, you've got the media nicely in hand. Mel? What? Hmm? Oh, what did you say? What is what I wanted to ask you? I don't understand. Every now and then, you, uh, you seem to get a look on your face. What does it signify? A look? It's either worried or thoughtful. I don't know which. Oh, well, I'm not aware of it. Gloria is concerned. She spoke to me. You seem to be having bad dreams. What do you dream about? I don't remember. Last week, she said you got dressed in the middle of the night and went out. Where'd you go? Nowhere. Scared? Sure. Well, that's only natural. You'll feel better soon. School's over in a couple more days, and you'll be able to have the kids campaign with you. I know. I miss them. Being a good father is also good politics. They photograph great. You have four good-looking kids, real boys. What did you say? I said you had good-looking kids. How many did you say I had? I said... You said I had four. Well... Why did you say I had four boys? <laughs> I guess I just forgot. Oh, the last see. time, the day you wanted to know if I'd make the race, you also said I had four. Well, Mel, I just don't remember half the time. Why did you say I had four? Why are you so excited... What's wrong? Look, Jim, what is it you want? What do I want? Yes, all your life. You've pulled the strings. You've been the power behind the party. You've always made things happen for other people. What do you want for yourself? I'm not sure I understand. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I guess, I guess I'm a little tired. I, I don't know what got into me. Yeah. Well, don't worry about it. Everybody gets edgy, nervous. I've seen campaigns where nobody would talk to each other. Still, I, I had no right to... No, I think nothing of it. Just get yourself a good night's sleep. <laughs> you said that was one of the things I'd have to give up. <laughs> Remember? Yeah. Are you asleep? <clears throat> Go back to sleep. No. No. No, I don't want a taxi. Yes, you do, Senator. I don't. You just don't want my taxi. You know why you don't want my taxi? Because I know where you're going. I'm not going anywhere. You're going to Roanoke Street. Why would I want to go to Roanoke Street? Because you want to go to the library. And why do you want to go to the library? That pretty good-looking blonde behind the desk. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you're kidding. What do you want? What do you want? Mel. Mel. What do you want? What do you... Mel, wake up. What? Wake up. What? What did oh. who want? Oh. No, nothing. Nothing. Mel, it's nothing. You... It's nothing, Gloria. Forget it. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Just please let me go back to sleep. Hello, Senator. Remember me? Who are you? June Miller. I don't know anyone named June Miller. We met in the park. Remember? Same hair, the same eyes, 
the same thing. He is your little. No, no. Do you deny him? What do you want? I know one thing. I don't want to be Mousy Jane Miller anymore. I don't want to waste my life hanging a bunch of miserable brats. What I know is worth a fortune. To whom do I sell it? Tell me. To whom? What do you want? Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. You've got to wake up. What do you want? Yeah, you're, huh? you're having a nightmare. What? You kept shouting, what do you want? What? What does who want? And why? I don't remember. Tell me, Mel, tell me. I tell you, I don't remember. You're, you're shouting at me. I'm sorry. I just can't talk about it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here at Historic Convention Hall. The long trail for the nomination has come to an end. Tomorrow night, the party chooses its candidate. Earlier today, I taped an interview with Senator Blaisdell. Senator, they say you have the nomination in your pocket. Well, our chances look good. The experts say this has been perhaps the most skillfully managed campaign in history. Would you agree? Well, I don't know. I I can't imagine how it was managed. It, it just grew. I say what I mean, and I mean what I say, and what you see is what there is. What you're saying is we won't be in for any surprises. No. No surprises. I'm here, Melvin, here in my car. Emily. I told you we can't meet anymore. I had to see you. It's too dangerous. I have secret service men around me now. I don't care. What do you want? Tommy is your son, too. I know that. Your other boys, they'll live in the White House. Only if I'm elected. They'll be able to say their father is the president. But you're Tommy's father, too. I know that. But nobody else knows it. And it isn't fair. Emily, what can we do? You know what it means to be the son of the president. What can we do, Emily? I don't want my son to be cheated. What do you want? I don't know. I only know I don't want Tommy to be cheated. I've got to get out of here. Melvin, come back. Come back. I've got to get away. Get away from everybody. Get in, Mel. Jim. Jim, what, what are you doing? want to get killed running along the highway at night? Get in. What are you doing? How's Emily? Emily? I know all about Emily. You knew? I always knew about Emily. That's why it slipped out. That's why you said four kids. What are you going to do, Jim? Remember a while ago you asked me what I wanted? Well, I always wanted to be president of the United States. But I don't have the looks. The personality. You knew about Emily. But I can be next best. The man who runs the president. I've got you in my pocket. All right, Pigeon, I'm taking you home. What did you call me? I, uh... I'm sorry, I shouldn't have rubbed it in. I won't in the future. That's right. You won't. Because there isn't going to be a future. No. No. Because I'm bowing out. You're what? You heard me. I'm stepping down. I don't want it. I heard you, but I don't believe you. I can't live this way. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Mel. I don't. Mel. Huh? Wake, what? Wake up, darling. What is it you keep dreaming about? Oh. I, I don't know. What is it you don't want? I don't remember. I don't remember. Jim, suppose I were to call it off right now. Call it off? Yeah. Why? Suppose I were to say that... that I'm afraid. Well, any man of sense would have to be afraid. Don't you want to be president? Mel? Yes. Yes, I do. How... how badly? How badly? That's funny. It's always put that way. How badly? <laughs> Why not how goodly? It's not a time for jokes. In less than an hour, you're going to be nominated. Mel, 
How much do you want it? I want it more than anything in the world. Then why do you even talk about calling it off? Gloria, darling, you'll believe in me no matter what may happen. Oh, what can happen? What can happen? Maybe... Maybe nothing. Maybe nothing. And then again, well, every man and woman has a secret. And in the eyes of the world, it could be a guilty secret. And we live in a world of surprises. And if you wait just a few moments, I may be back with a surprise myself. The awful power of life and death is held by human hands. Human beings are strange creatures, which is why it is possible to write so many stories about them. We ourselves can be blamed for much of what happens. Don't we elevate our leaders because we think they're gods? And then when we discover they're as human as we are, don't we drag them down to the dust? We deal with human beings and all variations thereof right here, seven times each week. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Leon Janney, Evie Juster, and Terry Keene. The entire production is under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.